Good evening. Thanks again for coming tonight. The program tonight is going to be about an ancient temple and the mysteries that took place in it. You've heard about the great pyramid, the great hanging gardens of Babylon. And one of the eight wonders of the world was this magnificent temple of Ephesus. Uh, the temple of Diana or Artemis there with the magnificent pillars with, uh, with gold placed between the stones as mortar. Well, I want to tell you about a temple that had the greatest mystery of all time, the greatest of all achievements of the ancient world, the most mysterious temple. The mystery within that temple focuses in a place called Jerusalem. Jerusalem has a mystery that surrounds it of an ancient temple that once existed there. The people that worshipped at that temple were called the Hebrew people. Within the sacred sanctuary of that temple, there glowed a light called the Shekinah, which was the very presence of the God which ruled the universe. But Jerusalem is a hot piece of real estate today. There are many different religions that would love to set up a headquarters there. What is the mystery and what does it revolve around? Well, anciently, the temple was on this spot where the Mosque of Omar is, and the most sacred part of that temple, which was called the Most Holy Place, was built right over a sacred rock that the Mosque of Omar is built over. That rock, the Muslim people believed, is where Muhammad ascended up to heaven, and so it's sacred to them. And when they got a hold of that real estate, they took over this very sacred center of the old Hebrew sanctuary. And of course, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people want that. They believe it belongs to them. But at the same time, the Christian world believes that that rock was split at the time that Jesus died upon Calvary and that that Shekinah light that existed in the sanctuary over that rock anciently was in fact the very presence of Christ. And so three of the great world powers or world religions see that rock as sacred territory for them. And it's made Jerusalem one of the most dangerous places in the world for international peace. We have to go back in history, back a few hundred years after the flood. There we find the land of Shinar in Mesopotamia was the first to receive the civilization that was established in cities along those fertile river banks of the Tigris and Euphrates. Among the many gods that were worshipped there as the people of the valleys apostatized was also the remembrance of the god Jehovah or Yahweh. One of the families that worshipped Jehovah was the family of Terah. He had a son named Abram. Abram was a dedicated worshipper of the god Yahweh or Jehovah. And one day, Yahweh spoke to Abram and told him, I want you, Abram, to get up from your family, to get away from this city, and to go to a place where I will direct you, a place where you'll find a city, a land, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham knew the voice of this living God, and he followed it. And I'm sure people thought he was very strange, but he knew that this God was the true God. He was the living God. You know, there was no statues for Yahweh. There was a statue for all the other gods, but this God was very, very different than all the others. This God could not only speak, but this God claimed to be the creator of the universe. And so Abraham obeyed God. And throughout his life, he continued to follow the leading of this God. He saw his wife die, buried in a cave. Before she died, she had a son, and this son was promised to them by God. This son was going to be the seed that would bring about a great nation that Abraham was told would be as the sands of the sea and the stars of the heaven for number, and that through that nation, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. As he saw his wife pass away, and then he grew older and pass away, he never fully realized this wonderful promise, but he saw it afar off. But God remained with those descendants. The promise was that the world would be blessed with the descendants of Abraham. And as we see the tide change in history, we see these Israelites, the descendants of Abraham, eventually in Egypt because of a terrible famine. While in Egypt they became slaves and they were bound by the Egyptians for 400 years. Well, what about the promise of God to use them as a great nation? 
God raised up a man by the name of Moses, and you know the story. Moses was called out of Egypt by God and sent back in to, to bring Israel out into a wilderness place where God could set them aside finally to begin to fulfill the promise to Abraham. When they finally came out of Egypt as a result of those plagues, and they settled on the plains there of the great Mount Sinai, God called Moses up into that mountain, and there he gave him a sacred law. Now, the amazing thing about this law, and this is the most amazing thing uh, uh, of any of the ancient religions, was that this law was not dictated to mankind. This law wasn't dictated through some priest. But this law was actually written with the finger of God. That's hard for us to relate to. Something that was actually made by some being that rules the universe, some being that, that rules in heaven, light years away. God came down to this earth and actually wrote a law for mankind and put it within man's hand. And he did it on tables of stone, which is a symbol of, uh, of, of lasting forever. Now, if you look at that law, the first uh, side of the law the first four commandments represent love or, or worship to God, the Creator. And His name is given in the fourth commandment, which is to remember the seventh day Sabbath. The last part of that law shows our responsibility in loving our fellow man. Now, Ecclesiastes 3.14 gives us some idea of how that law is to endure forever. It says, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, or put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it, that men should fear before him. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. It would be absolutely impossible for any little, weak, mortal human being made of the dust of the earth to alter the eternal law of God, written with his own finger and spoken from Mount Sinai. And when you look at this law, you realize something of the eternal nature of it. First of all, this God that rules the universe says you may not have any other gods before me. He's to be the number one and the only God among his people in order to gain his blessings. Then the second law says, thou shalt not make any images of any likeness in heaven or in the earth or beneath the earth. And you're not supposed to bow down to them or worship them. Do you realize how out of harmony this is with every other religion in the world? At that time, in the heart of every temple existing at that time, there was a statue of the God representing some entity in nature or representing the sun or the moon or the stars. But in this religion, in their temple, there would not be any statue in the heart of that temple. In addition to that, it does away with all... Uh, two-dimensional or three-dimensional items that are worn as jewelry. They could not wear any of these things that reflected any of the gods of the world around them. It completely done away with any kind of pagan worship. That says in verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down to them, because, he says, I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. And it says, Showing mercy to thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. God announces that he loves. And he loves his people so much that he's hurt if they break his law. This is just nothing like the pagan gods. Those were gods which were gods of fear. The entire system of paganism was a fear religion where you placated, placated God and offered sacrifices to appease him to gain his powers or his favors. Now look at the, the fourth commandment. It says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he hallowed it. To bless it means that God gave it a blessing. It was sacred. To hallow it means it was set aside for a holy purpose. 
That day was to be remembered by mankind. It was written in the eternal law of God. It was set aside as, at creation and becomes a special sign between God and his people that he's the creator. And of course, this is totally different be than the pagan religions because the pagans taught that life evolved from lower to higher orders. This is what the priests of the pagan religions believed. But in this religion, they believed that God spoke everything into existence and on the seventh day he rested and they were to honor that day as part of the sacred law, part of the sacred duty. The last part of the law represented God's love for mankind. But there was two different kind of laws that Moses was given on Mount Sinai for the children of Israel to make them God's people and his nation. Of course, we just talked about the great law that was written with the finger of God. But there was another law. The first law represent, written on stone was to endure forever. And that law was taken by Moses and it was put inside a sacred chest call, called the ark which was the heart of the Hebrew worship, symbolizing that it was to be sacredly observed as a perpetual covenant between God and man and never done away with. But notice there was a second law. Moses was shown a vision of a heavenly sanctuary that he was to duplicate on this earth in a, a, an earthly sanctuary. And all the ceremonies and symbols that revolved around that earthly temple would represent God's plan to save mankind. It would point forward to the time when God would send his son to die on this earth. All the symbols represented that work of God. But it was to be done away with, with the coming of Christ. And so, God directed that Moses should write it out. Now you see, if God had written it out, it would last forever because whatever God does, it lasts forever. Nothing can be put to it or taken away from it. But when Moses wrote it out, it indicated that it would pass away. Moses wrote all of it out in the book of Deuteronomy, we read, and it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book or a scroll until they were finished that Moses commanded the Levites which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, saying, take this book of the law and put it in the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee for I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck. Behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, ye have been rebellious against the Lord, and how much more after my death. So Moses put this law there with a prophecy that Israel would rebel as a testimony against them. And it was put in a, a little compartment in the side of the ark, but not inside the ark. The inside of the ark was reserved for that sacred law that was to endure forever. But the one that was to be done away with, that was against the children of Israel, that wasn't, that wasn't uh, a law that was to endure, was placed in the side dark. And you need to remember this. Now when we get to Colossians chapter 2, you'll notice that when Jesus died on the cross, he blotted out the handwriting, handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to, to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Many people today are terribly confused about this point. They believe that when Jesus died upon the cross, God's eternal testament, the Ten Commandment law with the Sabbath was done away with. But that is not the testimony of Scripture. The testimony of Scripture is there are two laws, and the laws of ordinances that were written against Israel that Moses wrote out in the book of Deuteronomy were done away with. Before the children of Israel could enter into these sacred services that represented the sacred plan of salvation to restore mankind to be with God, they had to enter in a special agreement with God. They couldn't just go into these services. They had to be purified. They had to be a holy people, a sacred nation before God could use them. And we read in Exodus that Moses went through a special ceremony for them. Beginning in verse 3, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord out, and then he rose up very early in the morning, 
and he built a magnificent altar. It must have been huge for all the children of Israel to see. And he, wrote, he built it down at the base of a hill underneath that magnificent mountain. And then along the base of the mountain, he put 12 huge tall pillars. Each of these stone pillars represented a memorial. It represented a witness of what was about to take place for each of the tribes of Israel. There were 12 tribes and 12 pillars. But the great altar represented the very throne of God. It represented the presence of God himself before Israel. Israel was about to enter into a sacred covenant with God. And then he sent men of the children of Israel, which offered up burnt offerings, and they sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of this blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Now if you think of these men moving through the, the, the children of Israel, there may have been anywhere from three to six million people on that plain. Now the average large city may only have three million people in it. Six million is a very large city. There's only 15 million in all of Australia. So you can imagine the immensity of this huge congregation. And the bulls were offered up throughout the congregation and the blood was taken in great buckets and brought to Moses who put them in great big basins. And notice that half of the blood was splashed against this great altar which represented the throne of God. And you can imagine the blood just running off that altar and just covering the ground and everyone could see this blood. It must have been an awesome sight. And then he took, after he splashed the blood on that altar, he took the great scroll of the law which he had written out and he read it before all the people. And they listened to God's laws, the laws and the ordinances that they would have to carry out to be God's sacred people. And they said, everything that God has said, we will do. For them to be a light to the nations, for them to be an example of God's plan of salvation to the nations, they had to carry out God's law in every particular. And God wanted them to agree to do all that he had asked them to do. Then Moses took the blood, the blood that was left, and he sprinkled it on the people. Now we, don't, we can hardly imagine this, the, the other half of the blood taken and spattered on the people throughout that vast congregation. And then he said to them, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. You see, the people agreed to obey God. And once they agreed and they committed their lives to Him, then God was able to touch them with the blood of the covenant. In this way, the people actually entered into a blood relationship, a blood covenant with God. Now think about it for a minute. If any of those individuals, they had been told before, if they, entered, they went up on the border of the mountain, they would be struck dead because they could not exist in the sight of a holy God. It was impossible. They could not approach God. They could not touch God. But now, through the blood of the sacrifice, the blood of the sacrifice touched them, cleansed their lives, and at the same time, the blood of this sacrifice touched God and justified the law. So through the substitute, through the sacrifice, they came in contact with God and entered into a sacred, sacred covenant. And that's just the part that Jesus plays. When he comes into our life, he purifies us. As he stands before the Father in the heavenly sanctuary, he shows his scars and points to his wounded side and to his death on Calvary, and he justifies us there at the throne of God. Through Jesus, we come in a covenant relationship with God. Once this covenant was reached with God, then Israel began the work of building this sacred, sacred temple where God himself pledged to come and dwell in the midst of those people. Nothing like it ever existed throughout all the pagan cults. And just to show the difference between the two, all the other pagan cults faced the east when they worshipped. But in order to worship in this temple, these people had to face with their back to the sun. You see, the sun was the object of nature worship throughout the world. But in this religion, they were to have nothing to do with the nature worship of pagan idolatry, the worship of the energies. Their worship was to be of the God who created the sun and the entire universe. And so they faced with their back to the sun towards the sanctuary which faced the west. Now this is what the sanctuary in the court may have looked like. 
In the distance you see Mount Sinai in the north, symbolizing the great city of the king, symbolizing where God dwells in the universe. The court itself was surrounded by a beautiful linen fence. This fence represented the fact that Jesus, the Son of God, has offered up his life in our behalf and that every man, woman, and child has a protection from God around them. Otherwise, friends, because of the sin, this world would not even exist today. But because of the gift of Jesus, we all have a chance to choose salvation. So the, this curtain fence formed a courtyard. And that courtyard symbolized then the things that take place in this earth. Now, if you notice right at the beginning of the courtyard, there's a, um, a curtain doorway. That curtain doorway represented the flesh of Jesus Christ. As God sent his own son, he sent him into our human flesh to enter this world. And so the entranceway into the courtyard representing this world represents the flesh of Jesus Christ. Everything that took place in that courtyard ceremonially represented what would take place in the life of God's Son when he came to this earth to suffer and to die for mankind. Now when Jesus finished his work for mankind, he ascended up into heaven with a new body. And that's what's represented by the second part in the sanctuary uh, courtyard. It was a beautiful, beautiful tabernacle or tent. The entranceway to the first compartment of that little tabernacle represented Jesus' ascending into the next veil or through his glorified flesh into heaven, there to send his spirit down into man's heart and work from heaven in man's behalf. Now, each one of the items or articles of furniture in that holy place, the first compartment of the sanctuary, represented a work that Jesus would do in the hearts of his people that accept him as their sacrifice and their savior. Then there was a last compartment. You see the next veil? That next veil represented a work that, that Jesus would do in coming into human flesh and united, uniting his divinity with humanity at the end of time. A final work to purify mankind at the end of this earth's history to prepare him to live with holy beings for eternity. You can see that the entire plan the entire system and all of its symbols represented the work of Jesus redeeming mankind and taking him home. Absolutely different than any of the pagan systems of religion because all their religions revolved around and their blood sacrifices revolved around placating an evil God with no hope of man ever going to heaven or to a paradise. Their religion simply taught the continual expansion of mind until he became a God himself someday, some mystical nothingness, joining the energies of nature or reincarnation, but never the idea that God would come into a human flesh and shed his own blood to redeem man and to restore him. That sanctuary had four coverings over it. And the interesting part of this is that each one of those coverings represented part of the work that Jesus would do in man's behalf. The outermost covering was black and ugly. It was made out of what was called seal skin, or they called it badger skin. It was like a little seal that lived there in the Red Sea. The, it was ugly, and it covered the whole thing, symbolizing that in Christ there was nothing about him on the surface that was beautiful or that attracted any attention. But notice that the next layer was red. It was ram skins dyed red, symbolizing the death of Christ in man's behalf, bearing man's sins. And then the next level, if you look, was white. It was uh, woven, woven goat's hair. It was pure white. And it represented now the purity of Christ's risen body as he ministers in man's behalf. And the next one, the linen, represented the whole plan of salvation. And in it, uh, as, you, as you were in the sanctuary and you looked up at this last curtain, this, the only one you could see, the last covering, it was just covered with beautiful, uh, woven uh, um, images of angels, glorious angels, and it was blue and purple and scarlet, and it represented the glories of, of heaven. You can see how everything in that sanctuary represented what Jesus would do for us. The Israelites 
took this sanctuary everywhere they went. And even later, when they built that great seventh wonder of the world, the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, over that most holy place where that rock is that I was telling you about, it never, it never it, uh, was any more glorious than this first tabernacle that was in the wilderness. Those that were set apart to carry out the services of the sanctuary were the priests of the family of Levi. They represented for, for Israel the firstborn of Israel, which was to have been set aside uh, to represent that God gave his firstborn son or his only son. And those firstborn were to be sacred. But the Levites were set aside in their place. Now these Levite priests, as they dressed up in the holy garments that were white, represented that they were pure, that they were like Jesus, representing the people. When Jesus came in, before Jesus could be our priest, he had to be a man just like us. For as much then as the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also himself likewise partook of the same, that through death he might destroy him that hath power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. It was just very significant that these priests were taken from among men with the same weaknesses that men have, dressed in a pure white garment symbolizing the purity of Christ and set apart to minister in man's behalf because Jesus became a man with the same weaknesses we have and, and gained a character through obedience and suffering so that he could represent us in the heavenly courts. And so in uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, we read, Wherefore, because of this, in all things it behooved him, or the Greek word he was bound to, he was under contract to, he had to be made like us, like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, he is able to succor or to aid those who have been tempted. He has suffered being tempted. He knows what it's like to go through suffering and temptation. So in each temptation, you and I have a priest that can minister his righteousness to our lives. The most important member of the priest family was the high priest. And he, in a more direct way, represented Jesus. He wore a sacred plate on his chest, a golden plate that had stones on it, 12 representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And they had the name of each tribe on those stones. It was placed right over his heart or right over his chest. And it represented that Jesus bears us on his heart before God, and he bears us by name. He confesses us by name before his Father in the heavenly courts. Then the high priest had on his shoulders two large stones, and there were six names of the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes, six of, on each side, representing that he bore his people, he bore their sins, he bears their sorrows, their troubles, their tribulations, that his shoulders are broad enough to bear all of our cares and all of our concerns and all of our worries. Jesus bears those before the Father for us. If we could only realize that Christ feels everything we feel, he knows everything we think, it would just, uh, it would make life a lot easier for us. We'd go through many of our difficulties a lot easier knowing that Jesus is with us through everything we bear. It's made absolutely clear in Hebrews chapter 4 that you and I have a high priest in Jesus Christ. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Just think of it for a minute. I have a brother, and uh, he loves me, and he'd do anything for me. And, and I could just imagine that if he was in heaven, and there he had the power to redeem me, and to make sure that I don't die and that I'm in heaven, I know that my brother would make sure that I'm, I'm going to be there because he loves me so much. And this is just what Jesus is saying. He's saying he took the same flesh. He took my flesh. 
He became my brother. He loved me so much, he died for me. And now that one who cares for me, who bears my burdens, who bears me upon his heart, stands before God in heaven saying, Lord, redeem him, save him. I've died for him, accept my sacrifice in his behalf. And I know that I have eternal life as long as I depend on that high priest who loves me so much. When you think about the stones that were on his chest, they were all crystalline stones. All these stones were formed out of moisture or mud, minerals of some type. But once they're crystallized, once they form, in spite of the mud and the muck that they come out of, they never are able to dissolve back in again. They're solidified and they become magnificently beautiful. And this is what God intends to do with each one of our lives. He intends to take us from the filth of this world and weave His righteousness into our character and then seal that goodness and that peace and that joy in us and solidify it so it can never be dissolved back into the sin in this world and He'll make us into His children and will shine as bright as the stars forever and dwell in a much better land. Now let's imagine that you're an Israelite and you want one of these priests to represent you and you want this beautiful new life that God has prom promised that is symbolized by the work of the priest in the sanctuary. Well, the first thing that you're going to have to do is you're going to have to get a sacrifice. You're going to have to go outside the camp and find a yearling, a goat or sheep. A female goat is what the average Israelite usually offered up as a sin offering. And you're going to have to carry that goat or drag that goat or pull that goat through the camp and all the way through the vast open space, about a mile to a mile and a half, to the sanctuary itself. As you look into the courtyard of the sanctuary, you'll see first a great big altar. This was called the brazen altar, and there were four horns on the four corners of it. Those horns represented all power. The, it represented the law on the throne of God. Every morning and evening, they offered up a sacrifice on this beautiful altar that represented that Jesus was continually being accepted in our behalf to maintain our life. It was called the daily or the continual or the continuance, the continual sacrifice. The priest would meet you at the door and he'd see the conviction on your face and know that you wanted to, to confess your sins and to give your heart to God so that he as a priest could minister for you. And so he'd invite you in very kindly and show you just where to bring that goat. Then he would tie the goat to the side of the altar, symbolizing that Jesus came into this world into our flesh and he was bound here. He was bound to the human race. He was bound to give himself as a sacrifice, a gift from God to us forever. And then the priest would tell you what all this meant and he would direct that you should, you should just lay that lamb down on the ground. You were to take that lamb and you were to tie his feet. You were to tie his feet and tie him to the ground just as you and I have, uh, have bound Christ. Our sins were placed upon Him. He was laid on this ground as Jesus came down to this earth. He says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. We read that in Christ... There is neither, verse 28, neither Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. It didn't matter whether you were a, a stranger or an Israelite, every human being was invited to take part in these sanctuary services. The exclusiveness of the Hebrew people is in direct opposition to their own teachings in the Torah. That sanctuary was for the people of all nations. And if men came and offered their sacrifices there and came and took part in the feast, they were to be treated as an Israelite as if they had been born in the families of Israel, born in the land. So it was for everybody, anybody, not just the Jewish people. Christ came into this world to be the Lamb of God. He came into human flesh in order to take our sins upon Himself. And that's what this little episode of this uh, man or this sinner bringing a lamb represented, he was now going to put his sins on the Lamb of God. The priest directed him to lay it down. He directed it to bind its feet 
And then he was to lean over and he was to place all of his weight over the chest of that lamb. Just lean. A 200 pound man could, could crush a little animal like that. But he'd put all of his weight over it and then he would confess all of his sins. In this way it symbolized that, that the man's sin was now transferred to the innocent lamb and that he himself had the purity of the lamb given to him. Just what Jesus tells us to do. To confess our sins to him and he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness and give us the robe of his righteousness or his purity. Everything revolved around the sinner offering up that lamb as a sacrifice. Now, this fellow, after now being clean, knowing that his sins are placed on the lamb, he must know that those sins caused suffering to that animal and caused its death. And so he's given a ceremonial knife by the high priest and he's directed to take the head of that lamb and bend it up so it has to look at the sanctuary. And then with the neck stretched, he slices the, the lamb's throat and the blood flows freely, but the priest is there to catch that precious blood in a bowl. Because while the body of the animal dies in that awful moment when it receives the sins and perishes as a result of the sins of the sinner, that bull represents the life of that animal as continuing to make atonement. Just as Jesus came down to this earth, and when our sins were put on him, he threw his head back up and he looked towards heaven and he said, Into thy hands I commit thy spirit, and he died. He was placed in a grave, but he rose from the grave and left the sins in the grave. And once he ascended to heaven as a pure and righteous God, he gives us that righteousness that's free from sin. Just like in the sanctuary, the same type of thing. The Apostle Paul described the experience that this transaction of righteousness for sin represents. He said, I am crucified with Christ. That means I am dead with Jesus Christ. But I'm alive. Look at me. I'm alive. I'm living. I died with Jesus Christ. My sins died with Christ. My self died with Christ. But I'm still alive. And then he makes the announcement, it's not I that I'm alive. You're looking at, at me, it looks like me, but it's not me that's alive because it's Christ living in me. I died with Jesus and now he's living in me and it's Jesus that's walking and talking to you. You see, one of the strange things about the Abrahamic promise was that the promise was not given to his seeds, all of his offspring, but the promise was given to the seed of Abraham, which Paul tells us in the book of Galatians, that seed is Christ. Jesus alone received all the, con uh, performed the conditions, perfect obedience to the law of God. And he alone can receive the promises and has received the promises then of eternal life for his life of perfect obedience. Now he offers to give us his life of obedience and we have to let Jesus come into our heart. We have to plead and ask him to come in, confess our sins upon him and ask him to come in. Then we have the seed within us and we're born of God. And John, 1 John chapter 3 tells us that if his seed is in us, we will not, we cannot seed sin because we're born of God. We have a whole new life because of that lamb. You see, it was impossible for us to obey God's law. We are too weak. And we, our lives could never match the purity of that law. If there was one sin in our entire life, we fell infinitely short of the law and were deserving of death. But look what Jesus did. It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 3, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. Simply that means that my flesh was too weak to obey the law. And the law could only tell me that I had to die, but it couldn't change my flesh. It says that God sent His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He came into my own flesh and as a sacrifice for sin or in for sin, He condemned or destroyed sin in His flesh. He brought sin to an end in His own body. And the reason that He did that, that He became sin for us, is so that the very righteousness of God's law, the very goodness of God, the very heart, the loving nature of God can be fulfilled in our lives who walk not after the flesh. We don't follow our own desires anymore, but we walk after the Spirit of God. We follow the mind of God, His leading, His guidance, His rules, His laws. We submit to Him.
In this covenant relationship with Christ, we read in Isaiah 118, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. What a wonderful promise. What a wonderful hope that we have as Christians. The next item after the brazen altar in that courtyard, after the sinner had offered up his sacrifice and the sins had been transferred and now he was clean, the next item in that courtyard was a beautiful um, laver and it was made of polished mirrors. It just shone and reflected the light all around. Now the priest had first taken that blood that represented the continual life, that life that bore the sins, and he put some of it on the horns of that altar, noting that the sins had been transferred to the horns of the altar. But in order to minister in behalf of the sinner, the priests had to continually ceremonially wash in the sacred water before they could go into the holy place of the sanctuary to minister in behalf of the, uh, of the Israelite. Now this water symbolized the cleansing, purifying work of God's Holy Spirit. The water up above in the labor, the labor had two levels to it. The water up above represented the Spirit of Christ that comes down out of heaven. The water down below represents that Spirit dwelling in this, this world. And the priest could ever and only touch the water that was down below in that sanctuary. They could never touch the water that was up above. Symbolizing we cannot go to heaven, but God comes down here. He comes right here close to each one of us and He keeps our lives pure by the presence of the Holy Spirit within our hearts. Now the priest, every so often, would have to offer a sacrifice for himself right in front of the veil or the first door to the, uh, the sanctuary. Now what that would symbolize is he would take the sins in the blood on the horns, he would take a little bite of that sacrifice into himself, indicating that he bore those sins. Then he would offer a sacrifice for himself and the sins on him would transfer to that sacrifice and then the blood of that sacrifice would be taken into the sanctuary to be sprinkled on the second veil inside that sanctuary and on the horns of a little altar called the golden altar of incense. What this represented is simple. It represented that the sinner, you or I, the closest that we can come to doing anything to help ourselves is by confessing our sins on the Lamb and then right there beside that altar believing by faith that that righteousness is ours and keeping our eyes on it by faith. That's the only thing that we can do. From there on the priest representing Jesus had to carry out the full work of bearing our sins and filling our hearts with righteousness. The priest would take that blood representing the record of our confessed sins into the sanctuary and they're sprinkling it, uh, putting it on the horns of the altar and sprinkling on the curtain, represent that our sins are recorded in the sanctuary. Our sins are recorded in heaven. They are remembered there. Now what that represented when the priest went in through that veil into the holy place was that Jesus when he was done with his work for us here on this earth and died, he received a new body and he ascended to heaven to begin a work there of, of sending his spirit down to work in our hearts. Now the first area the high priest would work in was that golden altar of incense. If you look closely at it, it had a crown around the top of it. That crown represented victory. Victory for the life of the individual who remains faithful in confessing his sins and keeping his eyes upon the sacrifice. On the four corners of it, it had horns. Now, if this little altar, this little altar was turned diagonally so that the four horns pointed to the four carnal points of the compass. It represented all power and all victory through the mediation of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary. A new life that has total power to overcome sins and to maintain uh, purity without falling. Now, if you notice, the priest is pouring onto that altar incense. That incense represented the life of Christ. 
It was mingled with the fire, which represents the acceptance of Christ's life in our behalf. And the smoke that ascended up represented our prayers ascending to heaven, Christ mingling his righteousness with them, and making each one of our prayers acceptable with the Father. And we know that he hears every prayer, every petition we send to heaven, the God that rules the universe hears it. And he'll answer every prayer that we send up in faith. The next item in that sanctuary, representing a work that Christ is doing in our hearts from heaven, is the golden candlestick. It was called a menorah and it had seven branches. It was made from one piece of beaten gold. One great piece of gold that was heated and beaten and heated and beaten and heated and beaten until it formed one magnificent candlestick. A magnificent work of art. God had to give a man special ability to, in order to do that. But it represented the life of Christ, beaten and heaten, the suffering of Christ, in order to become our righteousness, in order to become our Christ. And at the top of it, the top of each one of those uh, candles uh, that came out of the main branch, there was a little hole and there was a little groove in the bottom of seven lamps and that little groove fit down or that little knot fit down inside that hole indicating that our lives or those little lamps are grafted right into Jesus Christ and that they bear fruit because we're in Christ. You see the candlesticks were carved to look like a, a blossom and then an almond, a blossom and an almond all the way up to the top until the top was a little almond that was a lamp. And it represents our life is the fruit of Christ's suffering and that he bears us. Now only the high priest could minister at that candlestick. Thus only Jesus has control of our life. Nothing can touch us but Jesus. He surrounds us and he protects us. Now notice very carefully this symbolism. Those little bowls that represent our lives were filled with sacred oil by the priest. Now oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It symbolizes that Jesus puts oil, or the Spirit, into our hearts, into our lives. And then the priests would make wicks that they would tear from the old white garments of the priests as they wore out. They would make these wicks and put them in the oil. Now remember those garments I told you? They represented the character of Jesus. The character of Christ comes into us through His Holy Spirit. And Jesus puts it right into our hearts if we're faithful to confess our sins and to keep our eyes on him as our priest. Now then it's, it's the, the fire or the candle is lit by the fire that came from the altar that accepted the sacrifice in our behalf. And you know that was the only light of the sanctuary. It symbolizes that when we're in Jesus, we have a new life. We're a new creature filled with the Spirit, filled with His perfect character, and our light shines to all around. It makes us a witness of His glory to everyone around us. The last article of furniture in that sanctuary was what was called the table of the presence or the table of the continuance. It represented the continual presence of the body of Christ, of the life of Christ. Now, what did it represent exactly? Well, there were six, uh, there were six loaves in two stacks. That was 12 loaves in all. In each one of these loaves, it was salt on it, representing the preserving quality of Jesus. Between each one of these loaves, there was a little bars of gold, representing the God's law applied to each one of our lives. And there were bitter herbs on it, representing the suffering of Christ in our behalf. There was also a drink offering representing his, his blood there on that table. Now, the body and the, the blood of Jesus, we have to continually partake of every moment of our lives when we are, when we are in this covenant relationship. But how do we partake of the body and the blood of Jesus. Well, it comes out clear in the sanctuary service because you see, every Sabbath, the priests ate this bread and also they put the new bread out. So it was always a week old. But they ate this bread and it was on that day that they read the law of God or the word of God to the people. We receive Jesus continuously through a constant study of the sacred words of the Bible. Jesus is the Word, and as we partake of His Word, we actually partake of divine nature. We partake of the body and the blood of Christ continually as we eat His Word. This table was ever there as a constant reminder that Christ's life of suffering, His death, is constantly available to us 
by partaking of the Bible. There was another veil, and then behind that veil was the last piece of furniture in the sanctuary, but in the second part of the sanctuary called the most holy place. This was a sacred chest that housed the ark and on the outside of it the ceremonial law. It was the most important part of the Hebrew service because it was believed that once the sinner by faith had followed his priest into the closing work of that sanctuary as he entered into the most holy place, that the heart was changed and purified and sealed with the character of God or the law of God for eternity. And at the end of the ceremonial year, there was a very special feast representing the day of judgment and the day of sealing. On the top of that ark, there was a special golden plate called the mercy seat that represented the very throne of God where we come for mercy. And above that, there was a magnificent glowing light. Totally different than any other sanctuary on earth. This light was actually an extension of the God who rules in the sanctuary in heaven, an actual extension of Him actually existing here on earth among men. It was called the sacred Shekinah light. And once the high priest had presented the final sacrifice at the end of the year for the whole congregation, and it was accepted before this light, Israel was pure and Israel was clean, and it represented they would be clean forever at the end of this earth's history. Can you see then how this sanctuary is totally different than all the other religions of the world? Because as, as men came to this sanctuary, they were not offering up something to appease an evil God. They were offering up a sacrifice that represented the death of God to save them. And as they followed these symbols and ceremonies by faith right through with the high priest, just following what he was doing for them by faith through each one of those symbols, all the way into the most holy place, these people were symbolically taking that pathway of the plan of salvation back, back, back to the purity that Adam had before the fall and made acceptable to live with holy beings in the heavenly universe. That sanctuary was a Bible in itself. It was one of the most beautiful things and the most magnificent temple that ever existed on the face of the earth. Far from one of the seven wonders of the world, it was the most magnificent wonder that the world has ever seen. Every facet of that temple represented the work of Jesus in our behalf. Every nut and bolt in it represented the, the giving of the life of our Savior to redeem us. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. Jesus is your priest today. He's won a complete sacrifice, a complete salvation for you. And he's just waiting up there beside that throne for you to come tonight and confess your sins, that he can bear your sins and then minister that life of peace and happiness and righteousness to you. Don't take any chances with your salvation. As we study in the next few days ahead, you'll realize that we're right at the end of this Hearst history. We're right there at the time of judgment when the priest is doing his last work to seal men's hearts for eternity. Now's your opportunity to come to Jesus before it's forever too late and receive that beautiful new life that he's made available for you. I'd like to invite you to accept Jesus tonight. I know this program uh, presented many things that may have been new to you, but in it all, you can see the beautiful plan that Jesus has wrought out for you and how much he loves you individually. Let's pray together, shall we? Dear Father in heaven, I pray for each one here. I pray that thy Holy Spirit will come into each one of their hearts. I pray that you'll convict them, Lord, of the wonderful privilege that we have to be worshipers of the Creator of the universe and to know that Creator loves us and that He's a minister in a great heavenly sanctuary where we can come for strength, where we can come for healing, and where we can come, Lord, to receive salvation. Move upon the hearts, O Lord, in this group to give their lives completely to Thee before it's forever too late. Go with each one and bring them back again tomorrow night. These things I pray in Jesus' name, amen.